Well, good evening. I believe this is our week number four together. Is that correct? You know, I'm, uh, I'm grateful that we have Richard, uh, who comes, Richard Yeager, and tapes these every week. Not only do we have a chance then, if we miss, to get to catch up, uh, but because they're on the internet, other people that we don't even know are watching week after week, as we've mentioned. Uh, and we are on YouTube, as well as the church website. And uh, I don't have time to be on YouTube. I don't know much to do if I'm on YouTube. But uh, Richard, this past week, went on YouTube, and I guess you can send emails on YouTube to whatever you're watching. And he printed off all of these emails that have been sent over the last five months, uh, 26 different people, uh, <laughs> which is kind of staggering. And if they're wondering why I've never said hello to you, like we have everyone else that's sent us the first time, I apologize to you because I didn't even know you could send an email and it was on YouTube somewhere, part of a chat room that everybody gets to, to comment on one another. So I want to say uh, welcome to, and I'll just give first names and a last initial or your sign-in name, whatever we have, uh, Robert D. Kurt H., someone signing in as 70 AD, Freddie R., Someone signing in is Hold My Beer, uh, Sebastian S. Uh, Ann K. Ann sent a note, by the way, that, quote, as a direct descendant who has con a direct descendant of Jonathan Edwards, who has now converted to orthodoxy. Thank you. Uh, wow, my goodness, Ann. Uh, German C. Hytham Y. Sharon K. from West Central Florida, a Christian K. Dude B15, Dante B. Aditya S. Jason from Columbia, uh, Cryptoctopus the First in Montreal, Canada, someone whose code word was Bree Bree Bree, uh, Julie P. in Marysville, Washington, Mark B. A Colleen B. M. Jazz. Andrew in Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, Phil W., Lucy C., David S., the Metropolia. Uh, well, welcome to all of you. And if I miss said your name, I apologize. Uh, uh, if you would like to uh, say hello, uh, this is the fastest way to do it that I'll know that it happens if you use the church website address, St. Elijah at St. Elijah okc.com uh, I, I don't we don't have a chat room I don't have time to get involved with any of, of, of that though it was interesting to read some of the chatting going back and forth among you but welcome to our classes and welcome to all of us here some of our people that are normally here our choir also meets every other Monday night so every other Monday night we have uh, uh, part of our class over there learning how to sing the music we're going to have for Sunday so we are looking at the understanding the two trees that paradise has. And in doing so, we are looking at the world that is created by the tree that got chosen. This is part one of what we're looking at. Uh, the tree, how to learn the knowledge of good and evil, the tree that teaches us to know good and evil. And we've looked at several aspects of how that tree works and what that tree, the kind of world that that tree has created for us. And so tonight, in chapter 4, which is page 71 of last week's handout, we did half of last week's together, and so here's is the second half. So we're going to start on page 71 of last week's material. And for those of you watching, uh, someday maybe this will turn into a book you'll be able to get on Amazon.com. In the meantime, I'm sorry, uh, you just have to watch and listen and uh, 
do the best we can that way. So chapter 4, the sensate tree. Sensate, having to do with our senses. Secondly, the tree of knowledge is a sensate tree. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, they were looking at Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave it to her husband with her and he ate. But let us again look for the understanding hidden beneath the literal translation of the words. In the Greek, it would be, and Iden the woman. Uh, Iden is the same term we encountered previously in Genesis chapter 2, 9 as an infinitive, Idenai. It is from an obsolete Greek word, to see. That is to have seen something, to now know something from having seen it, to know something from the experience of having been taught it. We might think in terms of insight. You see, Eve, after hearing the alternative way of looking at why she had been told not to eat of the serpent's tree of knowledge. Remember, don't eat of that tree. It's, it's not good for you. It'll hurt you. It's harmful. But now she's been told, no, 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 no. That's not the truth. The real reason you're not supposed to look at that tree is because you're a second-class citizen, and if you eat from that tree, it'll make you a first-class citizen like God. Well, seen from that perspective, this food, the fruit on this tree, was now particularly appealing. She now experienced a new way of thinking about that tree, of seeing this tree of knowledge before her. Seen from the new perspective of equality and access, she now experienced a new understanding of the tree. She had an eye-opening experience. You see, it is good for eating, the story in Genesis continues. It is pleasurable and appealing to the eyes. She now perceived. It is beautifully ripe and ready. It was offering intensive sensory perception to her. It heightened her ability to feel it and imagine it. And she reached out and grasped the fruit. She ate it. She gave it to the man with her and together they ate. You see, this tree appealed to her senses. It looked good to eat, to taste. It was pleasurable and made her feel great, feel important. It offered to intensify all her senses, all her ways of experiencing delightful, pleasurable moments would be heightened. She grabbed it. She seized it. She ate it. This is a sensate tree. It appeals to the senses. Now, while itself is not empirical, <laughs> meaning you just come and want to touch the tree, it's not, what it offers is empirical. It is a tree limited to the senses and to the empirical world known by our senses. It is a limited tree which creates a limited world, a world limited to our senses. What we can see, what we can hear, taste, smell, and feel as well as what other senses we might 
have. You see, that which we call reality, the world, the universe, the stuff, is a single whole. And this single whole contains both that which is visible and that which is invisible, that which is sensate and that which is insensate. The visible and the invisible are both knowable, as are the sensate and the insensate. But in order to be known, there must be a knower, someone with the capacity, the capability, the means by which to be aware of something. The knower must possess the means to know. There's got to be something to know, and there has to be a knower. And in order to know, there has to be some interaction between what is to be known by the knower. It, they tell us that a dog can hear sounds we can't hear. We can't know that sound that a dog knows because we don't possess the knowability to do it. So to know anything, there has to be a point of interaction. If we are to know the visible, the sensate, we must possess the capability to see them, to be aware that something exists. If we are to see something, we must have the ability to see in the first place. That which we are to see must be seeable. I know this is just basic stuff. But think with me. We're, we're, we're contemplating together the mystery of creation. In other words, in order, in order for us to see something, we must possess seeability, sight. And what is seen must possess seen ability, the ability to be seen. Someone's always saying when you say hello to them, you say, uh, boy, it's nice to see you. And they'll reply, it's good to be seen. It, 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 the same is true for knowing that which is invisible, the insensate. We have to have the means of being aware of the presence of that which is invisible, that which is insane. That is, we must possess the capability of recognition. We must be able to recognize the presence of the invisible. Likewise, the invisible must be recognizable. We must possess recognition ability, which is recognized, and what is recognized must possess recognizableness or recognizability. Recognition comes from the Latin cognitio. Cognitio co combines the CO from the word come, to come together, with the nociere to know. Nociere is the Latin version of gnosis, the Greek term for knowledge, and the G-N-O, which becomes K-N-O in the English word knowledge, traces all the way back to P-I-E, the Proto-Indo-European language of all European languages. The root G-N-O for knowledge. Recognition is an acknowledgement of the existence of something or someone. It is a re-knowing in the present someone or something we have known before. I recognize you. I've seen your picture. I know you. I've seen you on YouTube. I know you. I met you at your sister's wedding. While recognition is similar 
to remembering. It is not the remembering of facts, information, or data. There is a difference from recognizing an answer from a prior exam and remembering an answer from a prior exam. For example, I'll know it when I see it. I'll recognize it when I see it. I don't remember it, but when I see it, I will recognize. There's a difference between being remember, for remembering and recognizing. In order to know the visible, we must possess the capability of sensing it. I realize that's the word sense and sensation. I, I don't have the words to describe what we're talking about. There has to be some way of being aware that it's there. We must possess the capability of recognizing its presence. If there is no parallel relationship between the knower and the known, it makes no difference whether they exist or not. I mean, it absolutely makes no difference if something exists if it's impossible for me to ever know it, if it's right here, if I, if I can walk right through it, never feel it, taste it, see it, big deal, it, it doesn't matter that it's there if it's not impacting and interacting in any way with me. The serpentine tree is sensate. It dominates and overpowers our senses. You see, if the world is made up of both the sensate and the insensate, this tree is going to dominate, uh, dominate our senses, overload our capacity to sense things, so that we end up ignoring, ignore, you know, have no knowledge of, ignore, pay no attention to, the invisible stuff. We spend all our time captivated by the visible stuff. It is a sensate tree, sensate tree. It's the bright lights and music of the carnival drawing us down the midway. It, it takes us away and gives us a world of only that which appeals to our senses. It energizes and makes our senses hypersensitive. It distracts our attention from that presencing of the invisible. It demands our attention. It drowns out our thinking. It's so loud in here I can't hear myself think. It's so bright in here, I can't see. We're dominated so much, we're totally unaware of that still, small voice whispering beside us. The sensate world demands all of our attention. By increasingly giving all our attention to the sensate, unaware that we are doing so, we ignore the insensate, the invisible. We are so preoccupied with the sensate, so distracted, we never bother to pay any attention to the presence of the insensate. That is, we are so preoccupied, we do not recognize the presence of the invisible. In a sensate world bombarded daily, in a celebration and preoccupation with our senses, we have forgotten any other world ever existed. Now, I'm not saying any other world in the sense of here's a circle in a world and there's a different world. I mean, there's only the world we're in and it's either the world of the sensate or it's the world of the other tree, the tree of life, in which there is both the visible and the invisible. 
It's not one versus the other, and except that's what the sensate tree does. It divides reality. That's part of Diabolos, the divider, divides reality and then gets all of our attention only on the reality it wants us to see. So we leave and ignore the other part of reality that is there. We have forgotten that world ever existed. We have forgotten the invisible ever existed. We have forgotten we once knew how to recognize the presence of the invisible. We heard your voice walking in the garden. Knowledge has now been divided. Once divided, sensate knowledge becomes exclusive. All but forgotten, the invisible way of knowing the invisible itself now becomes invisible to us. We forget it. We live in a sensate world now. The invisible has ceased to exist for us. Let us be clear. We live in a world chosen by Adam and Eve. They chose the serpentine tree, which is a sensate tree. We live in a world created by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That world and that tree say only this visible sensate world is real. The world of our senses is real. This world says the only knowledge that is real is sensate knowledge. That's the only knowledge that counts. Any other so-called knowledge is a joke to them that only fools and idiots pretend to know. Now remember, we are trying to step outside the circle the world that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil creates. The sensate tree says its knowledge is the only real knowledge. Remember, it's the tree that teaches us the knowledge of good and evil. We've got to take seriously what we're talking about when we talk about knowledge. And think about that for a little bit. It now says its knowledge that it teaches is the only knowledge there is. But having stepped outside of its world, we can now ask, well, is that true? Is sensate knowledge, the knowledge the world teaches us using our senses, is that the only knowledge there is? Or are there other ways of knowledge or other things to be known. So we are looking at the question of knowledge itself, the very heart of this tree. Do we only know what we can see, hear, taste, smell, and touch? Do we only have the capability of knowing sensate, visible things? Or do we also possess the ability to recognize the presence of that which is invisible and insensate, immaterial? How would we know whether we do or not? How would we know if we possess any other way of knowing? Well, let's take a clue from the board game Clue. Now you're going to have to relax and have a little fun with me. We have to speak in terms of metaphors, so we have to have a metaphor. Uh, I discovered today, by the way, that it, Parker's Brothers has gone out of business and Hasbro took over their stock of material uh, since 2009. Uh, 
But originally Parker Brothers is the one that published, manufactured the board game Clue. Uh, Clue is a detective game. Well, we're on page about 75 in your notes, right? 70 who? Six. A murder, a crime has been committed in this game. And the object, how many of you have never played Clue? Okay, about half of us, all right. The object of the game is to be the first to discover three pieces of information. Who did it? Who did the crime? What did they do it with? What was the weapon? And thirdly, in what room did the crime, was the crime committed? Who did it, with what, and where? Three pieces of information. Uh, there are 27 cards. Now I realize, after doing research on this, it depends on which clue game you bought. Some of them have less cards, some of them have more, so I'm going with that which I could get pictures of to use. Uh, just know that. There are 27 different cards, nine suspects, nine rooms, and nine weapons. You have the cards. You will have all of the weapons cards here, all of the suspect cards here, and all of the room cards here. You shuffle them blindly, and then you have somebody who will, you know, pick a card, any card, pick a card, not look at it, and secretly slide it into the, the crime envelope that's here. The same is done with the room and the weapon. So out of the three stacks, one card secretly, unknown to anybody, is chosen and put in the envelope. The object of the game is to figure out what three cards are in the envelope. So those are put over here, and now you shuffle together all the remaining cards. Suspects, weapons, and rooms shuffle together, and then you deal them out to the players. Now for our purposes, we're only gonna have four people playing. This is our board game. There's gonna be us. If you, I don't, Richard, can you see the us from here? Do I need to move this? I need to move it. That'll help the people watching this who don't have a book in front of them. So here's us. We're going to have Mary to our left around the table. We're going to have Tom here, and we'll have Sally here. We're going to deal out the cards, the remaining cards, to all of us. Uh, just in the sequence. And so each one of us now is going to have, I, I think uh, there's 24 cards left. If there was 27, we took out three. Four of us playing, we all now have six cards. So uh, you, you, those of you here, you've got a picture of the board that we're looking at. Uh, I'm not going to get into the rolling of the dice and you move, but you move around the board to the different rooms uh, that you can't see in my square here. I'm not about to try to draw the rooms. Uh, and then you get to make a guess of what's in uh, the, uh, the envelope. And here's how the play worked for those of you that have never played it. We're, here we are, and we're us. And, we're, and I don't know if I've got a guess in here or something. Uh, I don't know if I... Yeah, let's do it. Gosh, I, I didn't put the page number. Must be 77. Is that where it says example? Yes. Okay, I, yeah, I got it right here. 77. Uh, and we're going to say uh, Colonel Mustard did it with the knife. Knife. Uh, I discovered that on the sheet I've got here, it says dagger. <laughs> so he did it with a knife, the dagger in the hall? Study. 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 Okay, Mustard did it with the knife, the dagger in the study. That's my guess. You have to guess one suspect, one weapon, and one room. Now, the person to your left must disprove you if they can. If Mary has any one of those three cards, Mary knows 
that's not correct in the envelope. So Mary has to show the card, one of the cards, if she's got more than one, only one, to the person that made the guess only. So the rest of us at the table, we don't get to see the card that Mary's going to show us. So if she's got one of those, let's say she had mustard, she would show us mustard, and we would now know that if she's got mustard, mustard can't be out there in the secret envelope. Because <laughs> we've seen it. Have I lost all of you that haven't ever played this? I'm sorry. Uh, uh, and, and then on page, I think again, is it 77? You've got a suspect list or something there? Yes. The, the game comes with, and I don't... Rick, I helped you out. Richard, I've got one here that you can maybe zoom in on for those that are watching and maybe help us here. But y you've got a place where every time you see a card, you can put an X to eliminate those cards. If you've seen the card, then it's not one of the cards in the envelope. So you check it off as you see card after card. And if you only use this column, that's for game number one. This is for game number two. This is for game number three. This is for game number four. Uh, so if you get serious about playing it, you'll go through all of those cards pretty fast. So you begin to conserve and use one column for the game and so forth. So what the, the, the way you would do it is if we said mustard, dagger, and hall, which happens to be the first one in each of the lists that's there, and Mary showed us mustard, then we would put an X there to indicate that we've seen that card and we know who, that it's not the one that's out there. The object of the game is you get one guess per round, you give it, now the, the turn passes to Mary, she gets to guess a suspect, a weapon and a room. If Tom can disprove it, he does. If he can't, Sally has a chance to do it. If Sally can't disprove it, it comes to us. And if we've got one of the cards, we show Mary that card. And that's the way the game is processed around uh, as we're going. In other words, it's a sensate game. It's a game based upon seeing and remembering what cards you have seen. So, every time it's my turn, we're the us, every time it's our turn, we will learn one piece of information. We'll get to see one card. When it's Mary's turn, we don't see what card Tom might show her, we don't see what Sally might show her. We don't learn something on the other turns. So if there's four people, and one time around the board was four different people guessing, we learn something only on our turn. 25% of the time, and the rest of the time we're just sitting there ho-hum. It's a sensate game waiting our turn to check off. Now, we've already got our three cards, and so we would have gone down on our list. We would have put a square, square, square on our cards. Plus, now we know Mary showed us one. We checked that off. And by a process of elimination and the luck of how you got to guess on the board, which is another part of the game we finally begin to say, okay, I bet I've eliminated everybody down and it's got to be Mrs. White. That's the only card I haven't seen. And then you've got a weapon. It is a sensate game, in other words. Is that kind of clear? It's, we've seen a card. We get to check off that card. And sometimes we may win. But the odds are... 
only seeing one card on our turn, <laughs> it takes a while to get around the board and somebody else can beat us. Okay, the metaphor and the reason we start here is we're asking the question, is there only one way of knowing how to know? Do we only know the sensate? Do I only get to play Clue as a sensate game? We admit then that there is a, the world of Clue. Let me try to skip on over. Uh, yeah. What if, what if the game of Clue could teach us a different way of knowing that has nothing to do with seeing? Is it possible to not play Clue as a sensate game based on my senses? Can I play Clue ins insensately? Is there a way of knowing what I know without knowing how I know it in playing Clue? What if there was a way to potentially learn something on every person's guess every time they made a guess without seeing their cards and anybody else's cards. I'm not talking magic. I'm not talking tricks. I'm not talking hidden mirrors. I'm not talking cheating. What if we were actually created to live in the world of the tree of life where we would know both the visible and the invisible, since the world was created both visible and invisible. And what if, though, while Adam and Eve have forced us to be raised in a world that only knows the visible, what if we have not lost the ability to still know a second way of knowing simultaneously? From playing Clue? What? Well, let's see. I tell you what. I'm looking at the time. I don't want to push us. We're taking these more relaxed. I think we ought to, because if we were actually playing Clue, we would take a bathroom break, a beer break, a some kind of drink break along the way. Someone would get up and make sandwiches. So I think we ought to do that right now. Before we get around to the next round of the game, we'll take our break now, and we'll come back in a little bit and see if there's a second way of playing this game that doesn't depend on seeing. Okay? Let's take a break. If you'll join me, I think, on the... Last uh, paragraph on page 78 of your notes, I think, is where we'll pick up. <clears throat> the game of Clue is played inside the world of 27 cards. But how the game is played is the issue. As described thus far, as we've discussed it, looked at it, the playing of the game takes place inside a sensate way of knowing, of seeing the cards. The world of 27 cards, nine suspects, nine rooms, nine weapons is separate from the world of how we know the world of Clue, the world of our knowledge and how we are approaching learning while we play the game. 
the physical world of Clue, its board, its 27 cards, its suspects, is the world of the game, the arena in which the game is played. It's like a physical universe. But how one knows the arena, that is how one plays the game, and the knowledge one gets from playing that game is separate is a separate world from the universe of the game itself. In other words, there is a world of clue, and there is the mindset, a way of thinking, a way of acquiring knowledge, information, of knowing by which we play the game. We, in our daily lives, confuse our way of knowing with the world out there itself. We think they are one and the same. We think there's only one world of clue, the world we know with our sight, and there's only one way of knowing it. But what if we stepped out of our sensate world of sight and experienced the world of clue without the limitation of sight? What if there is another way of knowing that is not limited to our five senses? That brings us, I think, to page 79, does it not? Rediscovering the board game clue. Yes. We are looking at the question of knowledge itself. Do we only know what we can see, hear, taste, smell, or touch? Do we only have the capability of knowing sensate, visible things? Or do we also possess the ability to recognize the presence of that which is invisible and insensate? And how would we know whether we do or not? We have stepped outside the sensate way of knowing the game of Clue. Let us now approach Clue as if for the first time, fresh and differently. The world of Clue itself is still the same. It still has 27 cards, Nine suspects, nine rooms, and nine weapons. Three unknown cards, one from each group, have been placed in the envelope. Our goal is still the same, to identify the three cards in the envelope. There is a world inside this clue, that the physical world of how we just described, just like there is also the world in which we live, a physical world. And there is a way in which we approach life. How we solve the problems we face in living. You see, our problems are real to us in our life. But we approach our real problems the same way we approach the problem of how to solve clue. How do we solve the problem of what are the three unknown cards in the envelope? Who did it? With what? Where? That's the problem we deal with in this world of clue. And we approach that with our sensate way of knowledge and the metaphor is, in this physical world we live in, we end up living in it, trying to solve our lives and our problems the same way we try to solve the problem of who did it in this game, with our sensate way of knowledge. But what if the reason we fail at life is the same reason we fail at Clue. We're using the wrong way of knowing. 
Let us examine then on page 80 the board game clue further. The experience of playing clue is a whole, not something divided. There's a whole. Instead of only learning something when it is our turn, what if we learn something from the whole experience? What if we learn something when it was everyone's turn? Instead of learning something only 25% of the time, we would be learning something 100% of the time. We would be learning four times faster and increase our chances of solving the crime immensely. For the board and the players, it will be helpful if we can picture four players sitting at the table playing the game. The anonymously chosen cards, one suspect, one weapon, one room, have been placed into the top secret folder. The remaining 24 cards have been carefully shuffled together and dealt around the table. There are four players, so each player will receive six cards. We have Tom, Mary, Sally, and us. When we look at our cards, all of us are the us. When we look at our cards, we have Miss Peacock, Miss Peach, and I wrote the wrench. The game I play with says wrench. This game that was on the internet doesn't have a wrench, so let's say an axe, A-A-X-E. Our cards are Miss Peacock, Miss Peach, the wrench, the revolver, the kitchen, and the lounge. Which would mean on your list of suspects, we should all now place an X coming down this first column only. We should place an X on Miss Peacock. Who was the next person? Peach. Miss Peach. What was the weapon? I got 24 answers on that. The axe, okay. The axe down at the bottom. And the other one was? The revolver, okay. And uh, what was the room? We have the kitchen and the lounge. So we've marked off what we've now seen. This is how we start the game. It's the same way we started it a while ago. Yes? Okay. On our score sheet, we've now marked it. There on page 82. So now you should be on page 83 in your notes. What is it that we know without knowing how we know when it is not our turn? When a player cannot disprove a guess, we know immediately they do not have the three cards being guessed. If, for example, we guess it is Colonel Mustard with the knife in the study, and Mary, that was our guess, Mustard, knife, study, right? except there isn't a knife, it's a dagger. I'm going to say, anyway, same difference. That is our guess. And Mary, who sits to our left, cannot disprove the guess. It's going to be by her. We do not know what cards Mary does have, but we do know she does not have any of these three cards being guessed. It is not seeable, but it is knowable. Aha. We know something without having seen it. It is knowable, but it is not seeable. We know she does not have those three cards. 
If on a later turn, we guess Miss Scarlet with the candlestick in the conservatory, for example, and this time it is Mary who disproves our guess by showing us one of her cards, Miss Scarlet, we now know four separate things about Mary. She has Miss Scarlet, and she does not have Colonel Mustard, the knife, or the steady. Okay? We know four things. The game continues. Oh, and by the way, we would have probably put an X when she showed us. What did she show us, Miss Scarlet? We would have probably done this, put an X on Scarlet, and now we're slowly eliminating suspects, looking for the vacant one that would have to be in the envelope, right? Okay. The game continues, and the player to our right, Sally, it's her turn, and Sally guesses the professor with the knife in the library. We already know Mary does not have the knife since she passed on it when it was asked. Also from a previous turn, we have learned that Tom sitting across from us holds the professor card in his hand. Ah, so sometime we've already seen the professor card. So let's cross off the professor. So the guess is that Sally says the professor with the knife in the library. We already know Mary does not have the knife since she passed when it was asked. Also from a previous turn, we have learned that Tom, sitting across from us, holds the professor card in his hand. We have none of the three cards that Sally named, and it is Mary to our left that disproves the guess. Did you got it? Sally makes the guess. We don't have any of those cards, right? What's your professor, knife, and library? Was that the guess? Mm -hmm. Sally guesses that. We don't have any of those three, so we pass it. And it's going to be Mary who disproves. Now, of the three cards, professor, knife, and library, we know, according to our sheet, Tom has the professor. We also know Mary doesn't have the knife because it passed when it went by her. So if Mary now shows a card to Sally, it can't be the professor Tom has it. It can't be the knife because she does not have it. Therefore, the only card she can show is the library. And so we can come and now mark off library off our chart. We have never seen the library card. We have never seen the knife card. And yet we now know that information. Okay? See what's happening? Knowing and not knowing. We, we know the professor's here. We know she doesn't have knife. Therefore, she has to have library. Okay. So look at what we know. And I think there on page 83, it's summarized. Tom has the professor. Mary does not have the knife. Mary disproves the guest by showing one of the three. Mary cannot show the professor card since Tom has it. We know she does not have the knife. She passed on it already. Therefore, the card Sally shows must be the library. In the sensate way of playing the game, we only know that Tom has the professor on that guess. 
We waste 75% of the game waiting for our turn to make our sensate guess, looking for a sensate card, a card we can see. In Experiential Clue, the way we're now playing it, on somebody else's turn, we now know what they know without having to see the card. Here we are sitting here, Sally made the guess on her turn, and we know without ever having seen it what card Mary just showed Sally. Again, we know without having seen it. Is it about to click? There's two ways of knowing. We can know something from sight, and we can also know something without having seen it. It's called apophatic knowledge in the theology of the church, by the way. <laughs> in experiential clue on someone else's turn, we know what they now know without having to see the card. We know what card Mary showed without ever having seen the card. We know because we combine what we have seen, Tom has the professor, and what we have not seen, Mary does not have the knife. To know the only card left is that Mary could show is the library. In other words, we are using both systems. The way we were created to know before we ate of the tree that only teaches us to know its sensate way of knowing and keeps us distracted so we forget how to know without seeing it. Well, the memory problem, 84. When playing Clue, our problem is we can't remember what card somebody does not have. Now, we can put an X on our scorecard for every card we have seen. How do we keep a record of the cards we have not seen? What? How do you keep a record of a card you have not seen? Human language is our basic memory device. We retain an experience with words by which we understand the experience. An experience is remembered, in part, in words. The words, in turn, become how we understand the experience. Our understanding becomes our knowledge. Well, we must postpone exploring the relationship between experience, memory, language, understanding, and knowledge until later, if we ever get there. We're going to keep this short, so we're not going to probably get there. The point for now is this. We know how to remember things we have seen and heard. We write them down. We write a list when we go to the grocery shopping to help us remember the things we want to buy. The X we mark on our scorecard communicates information that we have seen. It is information we want to remember. We have forgotten, however, how to remember what we know about the unknown. The unknown does not mean unknowable. We know what we know about the unknown without knowing how we know. And we do not remember what it is that we know. It's like waking up from a dream. You've been in the dream and it was real, and the minute you try to... In the example in the clue game, played we've just played here, we know that Mary could not disprove the guess originally, Colonel Mustard, the knife, or the study. That's what our first guess was we started with. Therefore, we know she does not have those three cards. But how can we remember what she does not have? How can we remember what cards everybody does not have? 
We need a memory device to help us remember what we know without seeing. In order to create a memory device to help us remember what cards help us remember what cards someone does not have, we must first recognize that knowing what they don't have is something that can be known. I mean, we've got to just at some point admit, wow, knowing what you don't have is a kind of knowledge. I'm willing to say that is knowledge. We really can know what card someone does not have. It's not an act of faith. It's not an act of hope. We can actually know what somebody doesn't have. And this knowledge is important, perhaps even more important than knowing what cards they do have sometimes in the game. Knowing what card everyone does not have could account for 75% of all the knowledge when playing Clue. First, we must admit what someone does not have is a kind, a type of knowledge. Secondly, we must admit that this kind or type of knowledge simultaneously coexists mutually with the rational knowledge based on the cards we saw. They're both right there, same time, same place, same station, playing the same game. Both types of knowledge are coexisting simultaneously while we play the game. And number two. Third, we must admit that when both types of knowledge are considered mutually and together, we increase our opportunities for solving the game and winning. Three basic, if you don't believe that and can't accept that, then uh, I'm lost. Uh, once we admit these three things, our task is to create a memory device for remembering the cards we know that someone else does not have. This is not a straw dog. This is not just setting up some, do you believe this, this, and this, and then there's a punchline. No, I mean, either this is knowledge or it's not. It's a different kind, but there's two kinds of knowledge. Is that so or not? I know something or I don't. Admit it or not. That's what we're talking about. Page 86 then. A memory device for winning clue. This memory device is based on there being four players. It can be modified as necessary when a different number of players are playing. Forget that for the moment. Learn the way we can do it. Let us remind ourselves where everyone is sitting. We've got Tom, Sally, us, and Mary around the board. Then, on page 87, if we just do the board and pretend this is the board there. This is step one that we begin to have. There are four sides to my square. There is the bottom horizontal that represents us where we're sitting. There is the left vertical which represents Mary. There is the top horizontal that represents Tom across from us. And there is the right vertical, which represents Sally. That's where they're sitting on the table. How do I do this? Okay, we're gonna do it this way. Somewhere along the way, on our turn, I think, boy, what page was that? 89, 90, is it? Or is it the bottom? Eight, eight? On, our get, on our turn, we guess Colonel Mustard did it with the dagger in the hall. That's page 89. I'm on 88. On 89. On our turn, we guess Colonel Mustard did it with the dagger in the hall. That's how we're playing it now. Colonel Mustard, Dagger, Hall. Okay?
Mary, to our left, sees that she has none of those we guessed and says so. I don't have them. Means it's going to be passed to Tom. To indicate that she does not have any of these three cards inside the box for each card she does not have, draw a vertical parallel line. For example, now I've only got, okay, on this sheet, you've got a list of everybody. I couldn't blow this up big enough to make it work so you could see it. So I have enlarged on your pages there on page 89 and here for Richard, only the, the three that are the guesses. Have I lost you? There's a whole list of suspects. Here's only one of them, the one that was picked. There's a whole list of weapons. This is only one of them, the one she picked as an illustration. There's a whole list of rooms. This is only the one that she picked for illustration. And so she doesn't have it. She is to our left. We put and draw inside a line just there. It passed her. Dagger passed her. Hall passed her. What if, and this isn't in your writing, but what if you then, she passed it and it went to Tom, and Tom goes, by me. You would have gone by Tom, by Tom, by Tom. If Sally doesn't show you a card and you already know you don't have it, if Sally doesn't have one of those three cards, whatever that card is, if she doesn't have any, you just won the game. If she shows you one, nobody else at the table knows which one she showed you. But you now, if it's this one, you could put an S there for Sally or an X. I like putting initials because then it helps me remember who showed me the card. But the point is this, that's how you remember it got passed. You can remember that you did not see the card. It's a way to remember what you know that you haven't seen. It's a way to remember what you know without knowing how you know it. That which is invisible to, to be known in the first place. So, if we do that, uh, before long, turn after turn, our scorecard will begin to be filled in with two kinds of knowledge. Up and down that list here, instead of just having X's, you're going to have horizontal little inside boxes being done. So you know a lot. Every time there's a guess being made, you can then know Casimir showed that card. Bingo. I could put a K right there then if I need to remember who did it. But slowly I'm filling this up on every turn. I'm using both ways of knowing. Knowing what I've seen and what I've not seen. That's the whole point of this metaphor that we're talking about. There's two ways to know. We are created to know the visible and have a connection with the capability of eyesight to see that which is seeable, but we also are created with the ability to know what we don't see and understand what we've not seen in the process. So before long, turn after turn, our scorecard begins to contain the memory of two kinds of knowledge. Sensate knowledge of the cards we've seen we marked with X's or the initials. Insensate knowledge of the cards no one has is marked with the parallel lines. Therefore, on page 90, the alternative trees, alternative knowledge. In the experiential clue 
that we just played, we made use of the whole experience of asking, seeing a card, of asking and not seeing a card. We didn't divide the game into only the scene. We use both. By, we know by seeing a card and by not seeing it. But in the sensate version of playing the game, we were limited to a single way of knowing. You see, remember now, we're looking at the question of knowledge itself. The world around us is a sensate world telling us every day of our lives it's only a sensate world and you believe in anything that isn't sensate, you're an idiot. You believe in anything that's invisible and non put in a, can't be put under a microscope or a test tube, you are irrational. Whatever label they want to give to anybody who makes use of any way of knowing other than their single way claiming to be the only way to know something. We have to recognize the world that Adam and Eve chose. It's the world we live in, and it's the world that's teaching us, our children, and our grandchildren there's only one way of knowing, and it's their way of knowing. Do we only know what we can see, hear, taste, smell, or touch? Do, do we only have the capability of knowing sensate, visible things? Or do we also possess the ability to recognize the presence of that which is invisible and insensate? Is the unknown knowable? Can we know what we know without knowing how we know? In our own experience, in our own lives, from playing a simple board game like Clue, by stepping out of the normal, single way of knowing, we now know the answer. There is more than one way of knowing. One way limits what we know to only its way of knowing. The other way includes both ways and uses both ways of knowing. One way divides reality and only knows that part of reality. The other way accepts reality as a whole and by using both ways of knowing, experiences and knows the whole. Which brings us to the memory we can't remember. The world we are born into is created by the chosen tree that divides reality and divides knowledge. Instead of uniting knowledge and experiencing the fullness of sensate and insensate knowing, the chosen tree, the sensate tree, offers an alternative kind of knowledge. We live in a world with only one way of knowing and knowing only the knowledge that comes from that single way of knowing. We live, you see, the way we play Clue. We play Clue visually. We read the scriptures literally, tied to the printed words on a printed page. We worship visibly. This is bread. This is wine. It is nothing more. At best, it might have been a symbol, but a symbol of what? There's nothing beyond the literal to be symbolized. This does not mean that mankind still does not possess a second way of knowing. The fact we use one way of knowing does not mean we only have one way of knowing. It only means we have abandoned, ignored, forgotten, or never known we have a second way of knowing. We have chosen in that tree the alternative way of knowing. 
We have chosen the deprived way of knowing. We are deprived. Our knowledge is deficient. The memory of a second way of knowing is a memory we no longer remember. We have two ways of knowing. Life is winnable when we use both ways of knowing. We have chosen the tree that only gives us one way of knowing, one way of living, and one way of dying. That's the world they chose for you and me. Someone asked me at the break, how about da 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 da? And I said, well, we're still dealing with part one, the tree that got chosen. Part two is the other tree. So we're going to have to hang on for the other part of the story when we get to the second tree. Uh, well, God bless you for being here tonight. Uh, you didn't know it was going to come and play Clue. <laughs> so be careful going home. Thank you. <laughs>